Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Chuck Cassidy. Thanks for joining tonight. Uh, special occasion. Is it special anymore? I don't know. I feel like I pretty much live here at Wolf Dog Bus's headquarters with Brianna and Kiara just hanging in the background. Hopefully that's not too distracting for you while we do our live this week. Should be a good time. Uh, if you're just joining me, um, welcome. I try to do this every Thursday. And uh, the, the general format is like I talk for a while, then you ask me a bunch of questions. I share with you a tool that I love. Then I talk some more and then we call it a night. I hope that sounds exciting. Uh, this evening I am sipping on a semi-dry shilling hard cider Citrus Maximus. <laughs> Pretty special there. Uh, you guys drinking anything out there? What are you having? Some tea maybe? It's a good night for some tea. Um, I'm going to go ahead and hop into the comments section <clears throat> and see what we have going on over in comment land. Um, asking people where they're joining me from this evening. I, Wolf Dog Buses is located way northwest part of Washington State. We're just, I don't know like 45 minutes away from Canada? Yeah. Yeah. She says, yeah. The motherland, I guess, depending on where your mom lives. Um, <laughs> behind me, if you'll remember last week, this bus had just been spray foamed, I think. Is that what you were doing? Or were we, were we getting ready to spray foam it? I was wearing white last time. Yeah. I think we had spray foamed. And now, we have already installed the walls and the ceilings in this bus, which is really great. Um, oh, lots of buffering. I was afraid of this. We're doing a different internet connection than we normally do today. And, and I was concerned that maybe we would have this issue. Yeah, I can see that in the, uh, on the replay there. We'll see if we can improve the buffering situation. I'm gonna put the hotspot that we're going off of near the window. Does that seem good? Low, we'll go low, she says. Like down here maybe? We'll see if that helps. I know upload speed sometimes on the phone hotspots can be a little bit on the low side. Yeah, that's looking a little bit pixelated, isn't it? Well, I think you'll ju maybe just have to bear with me on that one, which is a bummer. I do, I do go to pains. I could try switching to a different hotspot. Um, I'm not sure what'll happen it's risky, you know, do I try switching to a different hotspot midstream? Oh boy, I'm gonna try it because it's like, it's a little too pixelated for me. We are gonna see. Okay, hang on tight, I'm switching it. I switched Wi-Fi networks and nothing crazy happened. <laughs> I'm gonna hope that that's good. And we'll see if uh, on the live stream, I'm gonna keep an eye on the feed and see if the quality goes up a little bit. Cause that would be super great. Uh, looks great. Oh, Griff, what's up, man? You're here. First time caller, long time friend, my good friend, Griff Snyder. We were in a band together for like a decade. Remember those days, Griff? That was so cool. Uh, he does great work. I'm one, I wish I could uh, real quick throw in a link to you know, Griff, I'm going to give you a shout, dude. I'm going to paste a link to your awesome video for Market in Black. Uh, this is a, one of the best songs that we did together. And I'm going to go ahead and share this link because I have a captive audience here. <laughs> Check it out in the comment section. Boom. My old bandmate, Griff. Great musician. Even better friend. Okay, so this is the best the Wi-Fi is going to get. Hopefully it hangs on tight for us. And if it doesn't, well, we tried, you know. Until I get Starlink, that might just be the way things roll while I'm up here. Uh, <laughs> lots of good comments here, though. People are in a good mood today. Is Mercury still in retrograde? I know we had, like, the eclipse. Mercury was in retrograde. And so that means, like, you know, communication was bad. Uh, I'm not big on the astrology stuff. I'm not the greatest. Don't cross the streams. Yeah, okay, way better. I agree, yeah. The 
the quality has improved significantly. We can roll with this. Awesome. <clears throat> So in my world, I don't have a ton of updates. We have just been plugging away on this bus. This was a rough in that we were doing on that tan bus that we sold. When, when did we sell that? That was back in January? Boy, maybe even, I don't know. And you know, we did the thing that always happens and we decided uh, to say yes to doing a few more jobs on it. And that's why there's a ceiling in there. And right now Brianna is currently installing the solar system, at least all the components and stuff that are living in this back corner. And hopefully the new owner will be able to pick this thing up. Well, we should be done with it by the end of this weekend. So then she can come grab it. And there will be a tour video that I'm gonna make about this rig before it leaves. But tonight, if I can get the technology to cooperate, I'm gonna take you on a tour with the camera on my phone on this live stream. And yeah, 720p, baby, almost HD. I'm gonna take you on a tour with my phone and kind of just show you what it looks like. If you saw the video of the bus when we made the for sale listing where we kind of gave an overview, um, you can remember what it looked like then. It was totally gutted. And since then, we've roughed in all the electrical and the plumbing, we've done the spray foam, we framed it, put in windows, um, all kinds of stuff. And hopefully that's kind of an interesting and cool transformation. I know a lot of people have been curious about this panel ceiling that I do. Um, to me, it is the maybe simplest and cheapest way to do a ceiling. Um, and it can look really good too, but it's definitely, you know, not everybody's aesthetic taste. Uh, I think it looks good though. I think it turned out really nice on this bus. Um, we picked up some, yeah, Mercury is still in retrograde. Dang it, dang it, man. <clears throat> we did pick up some really nice birch plywood though that we used for the walls. And what was cool is the distributor up here when we were shopping, they had some 3 8 inch uh, thick plywood in stock. So we decided to go with that. Normally I would do half inch, but really you don't need half inch uh, to be honest with you. So we went with the 3 8 on this, saves you know 25% of the weight, which is good on this bus because short buses don't have a very high weight capacity. So that felt like a good move. And overall, I'm very pleased with how it's coming together. It's a, it's a sharp looking bus. Definitely something you'll want to stick around for the live chat um, to catch a tour of it before we go too far. Oh, Brianna's getting serious. She's got the cable crimper out. She's getting really serious in there. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and let's break it open and let's do some questions and then I'll do the tool du jour and then I'll take you on the tour du jour and then we'll wrap it up with more questions because there's always questions to be had. So if you got some, if you got some bangers for me, put them in the live chat. And while you're scrolling to the live chat, while your eyes cast their gaze over the screen, go ahead and smash that like button, would you? That would just be awesome. I would appreciate it. I just did it. It felt really good. Tell your mom to maybe watch and smash it for me too, or your dad, you got an uncle. I bet there's an uncle you know who would like to watch my channel. Send him a link, you know? <laughs> um, <clears throat> who's Charlie? I don't know who Charlie is. That's a weird question. Um, perhaps, uh, <laughs> I like that the people in my comments section in the live chat are as free associating and slightly unhinged as I feel on the inside. <laughs> Wes, what up? We got Transcend Existence in the house. Uh, one of my best builder buds. Um, spent a lot of time at his shop. If you don't know Wes, uh, he has a shop in Wichita called Dark Wolf Artisans. And they do primarily metal fab on buses, lots of roof raises. I mean, they crank out the roof raises, but they also do other custom metal stuff. And aside from that, Wes is just a really, he's, I would say, I would describe him more as an artist who is also a builder because he's, I think in my mind, way more defined by the art that he makes <laughs> than the work that he does, although he does great work, but um, he's always doing super creative stuff. <clears throat> All right, so I'm, I see a couple questions, so we're gonna go ahead and talk about them. Uh, big Rolling Home, how many foot long is this short bus? Uh, your bus is 19 foot. <clears throat> so my bus is 19 feet from the back of the driver's seat to the back wall. Overall, it's 27 feet. This bus, do you remember, Brianna? We just measured it. Oh, yeah, we did. We just measured it. It's like 
20, 22 feet bumper to bumper. And then from the back of the seat back, it's 14 feet. Um, we had to calibrate this bird's eye 360 camera situation, which is really cool. Um, it's a lot of work to install though, because you got to install four cameras very precisely and then calibrate them with an equal amount of precision. And that was a fair bit of work, but it's really cool. <clears throat> uh, when is Brianna going to post day in life, day in life with Chuck? That's a good question. That's a good, that's a good question. She's definitely been filming lots of stuff. I'll tell you that much. Um, <laughs> hope you got the hitch upgrade info I sent you. I did get that. I'm still figuring out what to do with the hitch situation. I thought I had it licked and then the hitch that was suggested to me didn't work. And honestly, I, th I think what I'm leaning toward right now, because I have these brackets that hold the bumper on that I also have to remake um, to use most of the commercially available hitches. And I want to keep the bumper as it is. So what I'm leaning toward is having a little collab with my friend Luke at schoolie.com and just coming up with my own custom hitch. Uh, <clears throat> I think that's going to make me the happiest probably. But I don't know. I got to hurry up and figure that out. <clears throat> uh, likes release endorphins. That's right. So hit that like button. Get that endorphin hit. <laughs> Bart, what's up, man? It's good. To, it's always nice. To see. You are very good about showing up in my live chats, man. Thank you for being here. <clears throat> Let's see. If I want to come up there, this is Steve Longhurst. Hello, Steve. If I want to come up there and learn how to build a bus with you guys, is that something, oh, why did it scroll down? Is that something that's possible? It would be a bus build for myself. Steve, unfortunately, no. Um, but I do think often about the idea of doing some type of workshop type event. Like I see, yeah, like a summer camp. Um, Jess Rambo, who um, her Instagram handle is the Painted Buffalo, she is doing something like that. I think maybe right now it might have already happened, but she had she has a plot of land, and uh, she was having people over for a little bus building workshop camp. Looked really awesome, and uh, yeah, I would love to do something like that. The logistics are a little bit tough to figure out because. I would essentially need to be on a piece of land, much like the one I'm on right now, but <clears throat> but you would need a place for people to camp and stuff like that. But I love teaching. It's one of my favorite things to do. So um, <clears throat> let's see, here we go. Ashley, what's the best starting point for roughing in my electrical? I'm building on my bus now, but it's still in the end of the demo stage as well. Ashley, the best time to usually do the rough in for your electrical is once all of your wood framing is complete. So. Once all your framing is in, you can then put the wires and the junction boxes and switches and stuff in that you'll have your wire running to and attach the wire to the wood and things like that. That's usually the best time. Um, <clears throat> what am I using to seal the external panels after doing a roof raise? Good question, Grayson. Um, on my bus, I used a 3M's clear seam sealer. It's a two-part... Um, mixture so you need a double plunger caulk gun it's got like two tubes in it and um, i use that i think a uh, pro tip here you know this is a question i deal with all the time because in my roof raise video i didn't put sealant between the sheets and so everyone loves to ask me the question and like you know i have not had that be an issue but it is not much extra work to go ahead and put the sealant in there so you might as well do it um, but uh, that would be my recommendation. Doing the seam sealer afterwards is great, but uh, it's like a whole other round of caulking that you got to do. So at the end of the day, I don't know what is, what is more work or not, to be honest. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> here we go. Here we go. Uh, when your beard starts turning gray, will I color it? <laughs> I've already got some grays, but I'm, I'm going to let that do whatever it does. Uh, what do I, oh, oops, any plans to come out east? You know, maybe I might come out east. I just, I'm not familiar with the east coast much at all. And I really love the west because the expanses are so much bigger and boondocking and stuff is a lot easier. And I love mountains. There are some mountains in the east, but who knows? I'm not saying anything's off the table completely, but 
Um, what do I use to paint my buses? Well, the only bus in recent history that I've been a part of painting was my bus. And I actually did that with Wes, Transcend Existence, who's <clears throat> in the chat now. And Wes, I don't know if you can remember, I don't remember the exact brand of the paint that we ended up going with, but it was like a mid, it wasn't the most expensive paint, but it was a really nice single stage paint. Um, single stage meaning it is just the color coat. There isn't a clear coat on top of it, and that's how it's designed to be. Um, and I've been really happy with that. I also am a big fan of using um, an epoxy sealing coat. Um, in the auto body world, there's a difference between a sealing coat and a priming coat, and that was something I learned with Wes. Like, <clears throat> typically when you do a priming coat, there's gonna be another round of sanding after that to help make everything super smooth. And we weren't really trying to do that. We were just trying to give everything a nice uniform base for the paint to adhere to, and so that the color that goes on top of it would appear uniform because it's not trying to, you know, my bus is green, it's not trying to put green over yellow and black and then the gray of the bare metal. This is um, a way to help make sure that that color appears more uniform and has something nice to stick to. And, and Wes is really the expert on that. Like I was very much, you know, trusting, <laughs> trusting him in that because he's painted, I mean, Wes, I don't know, thousands of cars. And uh, yeah, so it was awesome to have him in my corner for that. Times before that, when I've been the one painting a bus, um, I use the epoxy primer sealer as well. And then I would use the nicest single stage um, automotive paint that the customer was able to provide. <clears throat> but I only, I only painted for a customer, personally, I've only painted one bus. Um, for myself, I've painted two buses, and then for my old party bus company, I painted probably 12 of them. But <clears throat> those, were, those were really bad paint jobs. We just used frickin' Rust-Oleum over whatever we had, no prep, no nothing. <laughs> and you know what, it worked, it worked well. <clears throat> it would hold up for a couple years. <clears throat> What's the best way to reach Wes for a roof raise? Well, you could uh, send him an email. <clears throat> Wes, if you're cool with it, go ahead and put your email address in the live chat. But shoot him an email. Um, it's getting to be that season where everyone's gonna want one. So definitely, if, if you want a roof raise from Wes, reach out sooner than later is what I would suggest. Um, and I know he's a busy dude, so it might be a minute before he gets back to you. He's also gonna be at the bus fair. And if you haven't heard about the bus fair, it's like, I'm just gonna probably be so annoying about this, but it's something I really love. It's a festival that I helped my friend Brock put on in Oak Ridge, Oregon. It's in June, the 22nd through the 23rd and I'm putting together a full day of seminars led by myself and other experts on various schooly topics, everything from finding the perfect bus through learning how to drive it, do the mechanicals, get a layout, get your solar in, um, do a roof raise, some metal fab tips, which Wes will be teaching alongside Luke from schooly.com, um, and then tips for living on the road, and then a whole hour of just all of us sharing our favorite tool du jours, like show and tell, tips and tricks. And like, if you ask me that one hour where we share with you all of our favorite hacks and tips and stuff, that's worth the price of admission alone. But uh, oh, I just like it because it's, <clears throat> it's a festival really geared toward the community and teaching people and helping, you know, helping us all do this really well. So I love that. I'd love to see you there. If you wanna come, we could hang out. Um, here we go, here we go. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've got, I haven't talked a whole lot today, and now my throat is getting a little phlegmy. All right. Oh, Steve Drumheller, you're on your way to Jess's bus building workshop. That's awesome, okay. School is cool. Uh, just weld the hitch on, it will never come off. Well, yeah, Joe, I mean, the problem is that the hitch that I had on my bus was a class four hitch. And I really think for me to feel good, I want a class five hitch. So I do need to kind of start over from scratch. And a lot of people told me to weld it and you know, that's cool. I hear you. I would just rather have it all be bolt on a bowl. Um, <clears throat> how about painting all the furring strips in the back sides of the plywood kills to reduce chances of in-wall molding? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the sky's the limit in terms of the steps you can take to 
prevent mold and things like that. And ultimately, it's kind of a balancing act between, like when I'm doing a build for a client, between their budget and the amount of time I have to do the work for them. And if it's your build though, <clears throat> paint is pretty cheap, especially kills primer. You know, a gallon of that could probably prime the backsides of all of your walls. So if you're cool with adding that step, I mean, by all means, go for it. I don't foresee any type of drawback there. Um, <clears throat> Robert Ge Gearing. Oh, that's nice. Match my five. It's the least we can do. Hey, thanks for the five bucks, Robert. That's really cool, and I really appreciate it. Um, it helps make me feel really good about making these videos <laughs> because right now Brianna's in there making money, and I'm out here just making a fool of myself. Uh, <clears throat> when you do spray foam, does the bus need to be level? It sure doesn't, um, but I can see why you might think that. James Owens, yeah, tr send a message to Wes. <clears throat> he, honestly, there are very few people I can recommend who I also know personally, and Wes is one of them, Brianna's one of them, Luke is one of them, um, who else do I got? Kyle over at uh, Yeti Bus. My circle isn't that huge, um, but we're all... We're all people who I really appreciate. Bart, thank you for throwing in the 919. I don't know why you're giving me money, Bart. That is because I bet your your van's probably due for another transmission. <laughs> Seems to be all right. It's like every three months, every oil change, it's time for a new transmission. <clears throat> Deborah, you got 70 acres. Yeah, we could do a workshop there. That's for sure. Um, knowing uh, you aren't a fan of rear engine buses for the ease of maintenance, don't you find that the design space of engineering is easier than Jeffrey, <clears throat> I don't know where you caught that I would have ever said that because <clears throat> I'm so sorry, my throat is like really chunky. I, uh, I've never felt that rear engine buses were hard to work on. Um, and I, if I ever said that in a video, I apologize because that is not an accurate reflection of what I believe. Um, I think rear engine buses are just as easy to work on as a dog nose, and for some jobs, quite a bit easier um, because you don't have a radiator and a fan right in between you and the front of the motor. So changing belts and stuff, way easier. Um, and if I could, I would much rather drive a rear engine bus than any other type of bus. They just, for the types of buses that I personally want to have as my rig, Finding a rear engine bus that's under 30 feet is like, you know I love unicorns and I think I'm pretty good at finding them. They just don't exist. Um, I saw a 30 foot Bluebird once that was a rear engine that was used as a transit bus and I've seen probably two or three of those, but that's it. Um, if I could, I would take one, 100%. But uh, there's no doubt that they are a superior platform for over the road, coach, motorhome conversion type things. There's just, there's no doubt there. Well, it's the reason I like them the most is because they're quiet. I also like them because I so all the quiet, you know, that you have in the driver's compartment, all the heat from the engine is behind you. But also the drive shaft is like this long and it doesn't take up space, you know, the whole length of the chassis, the same for the exhaust, which means that your storage possibilities under the bus are just wide open. And I really, really like that. That is maybe one of my favorite parts of it. Um, <clears throat> so here we go. Have you ever considered coming to the Ozark Mountain area? Lots of National Forest Service areas here and boondocking and lake areas. Well, see, Beth, that's what I'm saying. Like, I need to maybe expand my horizons and, and get out there into those Ozarks. Super old mountains. <clears throat> Some of the oldest in the world, I do think. John is asking if I think tempered house windows would work in schoolies, and no doubt, they definitely would work. And someone who probably has more experience installing them in buses more than anyone is Wes. <laughs> Wes, it's your, it's your night, man. You keep coming up. But uh, <clears throat> most of, well, at least when I was out there a bunch last summer and um, over the winter this year, back in December, they were doing a lot of the house windows in buses. And it's a cool way to go, honestly. I mean, RV windows are substantially better than schoolie windows and still suck. I mean, they have a lot to be desired that they leave on the table. The biggest one for me is that those RV windows have an aluminum frame, whereas unless you buy very expensive 
house windows, they're going to be made out of vinyl. And vinyl is not the same conductor of heat and cold that aluminum is. So in very cold conditions, you will get ice um, on the aluminum frames of your windows. And when that ice melts, if it's cold and humid inside, or just in general, when that ice melts, it goes into your walls. And that's not a problem you would have if you had vinyl windows. So that's an advantage there. Um, house windows are about the same price, honestly, but they are also square. And square windows are quite a bit easier to trim out and frame around than the radius windows of RVs. But uh, one thing I don't like about house windows is <clears throat> you have to be much more precise with your installation and how you seal them because they don't have a flange the same way an RV window does to give you a good sealing surface. So you have to make your cuts and your openings very precise and use a high quality sealant there to make sure that they're watertight. But by any, they're not a bad, a bad option at all. Uh, <clears throat> Jeff, what you got? Uh, 1,460 watts of Q cells. Uh, would two 24 volt, 200 amp hour EG4 uh, battery racks be a good start for 50% off grid use? Yeah, I mean, that's a lot of uh, battery storage. It's way more than I ever had in, my, in the last bus that I lived in, <clears throat> that I moved out of in 2020. I lived in that bus for five years and I only had, uh, I had eight golf cart batteries, which at the time sounded huge, but eight golf cart batteries, each one was good for one point, what was it? <clears throat> I think it was 1.2 or 1.5 kilowatt hours, but you could only really use half of that. So yeah, so I had 12 kilowatt hours available to me and I could only use six. Yeah, so I had basically half of what you're proposing. <laughs> that's what, and that's what Brianna had. Yeah, we, we were lead acid people. And you know what? We, it's, we talk fondly often of the good old lead acid days because there's no computer in a lead acid battery. There's nothing between you and getting the energy out of that battery except for your own willpower and whatever crusty connection you have on the terminal post. And that's pretty cool. But they're heavy, they require maintenance, they're short-lived, and you know, they require you not to drain them all the way and they're very susceptible to a phenomenon called the Pukert effect, which is basically as you put a load on a battery, the voltage of that battery drops. Lithium batteries are really good at keeping their voltage high even when a big load is put on them. Whereas lead acid batteries, it's pretty linear and it can kind of get extreme to where if you put a big load on a lead acid battery, that voltage is gonna drop quick. <clears throat> so much so that it will trigger probably the low voltage shutoff on your inverter or something like that. So anyway. What's also cool though, uh, lead acid battery, you know, they are like 99% recyclable. The plastic housing is recyclable, the lead is recyclable, and so is the electrolyte. That's really cool. Anyway, <clears throat> let's keep cruising. Thank you for listening in from Florida, Lane. Uh, that guy, uh, my bus fuel tank is rusted and leaks, so I need to change it out. It's probably the worst thing I had to do in the build. Yeah, that's a bummer. Um, I don't know what to say other than my thoughts are with you. Do, uh, David is asking me, do I slide the galvanil up under the gutter and between the roof sheet? Do you use some kind of sealant when installing? So in general, I do not. Um, on most buses, yeah, I don't have an easy way to show you, but <clears throat> on most buses where that roof sheet comes down, the rivet line is about three quarters of an inch up from that seam. So when I have everything demoed, before we install the panels, I'll go up there with a thin scraper or pry bar and just kind of scoot it out. And then when we're hanging the sheets, we'll have them up in place and then I will pound on the bottom edge of the sheet with the hammer and drive them up into that gap. So that's what I do. And the reason I feel good about that is because in all those situations, the roof coming down, the gutter extends past the top of that sheet by like, I mean, shoot, on that Bluebird, it's like, I don't know, it's like almost two inches. So I feel really good about that. And we've never had an issue with that. So I feel comfortable continuing on with that. But some people will go ahead and remove that top row of rivets 
and slide the sheet farther up. And that's also, of course, fine. So here, here you go. Uh, anyway, uh, Leticia, hi from Colorado. Hello, I miss that state. What a good state. Christopher, what's up? Uh, I'm finishing up a Ford Transit conversion. I've been loving it, but my family is outgrowing it soon. And you're just finishing it. <laughs> and I'm looking for a 36, 30 foot rear engine. The Bluebird All American looks good. Yeah. Um, Bluebird All Americans were their top of the line bus. Um, the frames were made with a higher tensile strength steel. And that usually means that the transmissions and engines in them were also more on the high end in terms of being overbuilt, overpowered. So, um, are the festivals recorded for purchase? They aren't. That's something that we've thought about, but it's not going to happen this year. Um, Zoe Johnson, hey, speak of the bus fair. Zoe is going to be there and uh, leading one of the seminars. Um, you're going to want to catch that one because uh, her and her partner are professional bus drivers, or not bus drivers, over the road truckers, uh, which is awesome. And they'll be teaching everyone how to drive a bus <laughs> as a professional. Um, <clears throat> it's like a scavenger hunt just to find a rear engine under 35 feet. It's true. And that's under 35 feet, which is why I say under 30 feet. Like they really just don't exist. Um, <laughs> Wow, so Big Rolling Home uh, says he has a warning sticker on his dash saying, hearing protection required. Just for the driver, not the kids. <laughs> um, hey Chuck, what do you think about adding a co-pilot seat? Well, me and Brianna were just waxing philosophical about that issue today because she has a four by four converted shuttle bus built on an E450 uh, van chassis. I'm looking at it outside this window. And one of the coolest things about it is that it has both a driver and a passenger door and a driver and a passenger seat in that front area. And no other, no school buses really come with that. The, uh, it's just, it's so much nicer when you're traveling with somebody to have them sit next to you. There's a, a, a phenomenon I call driver isolation syndrome and it affects um, 10 out of 10 bus drivers where you are on a long trip and there are people but behind you carrying on and having a good time, but because no one can sit next to you, you end up feeling all alone. And it's sad. That's why, you know, if you look back a couple years ago on a few of the buses we built in my shop, we relocated the front door back to the middle of the bus, blocked that over with blanks, and then that allowed seating up in the front. We did that maybe four or five times, I think. Um, if my butt, if my own personal bus was longer, I would have loved to do that because I really like having a co-pilot seat. I think it's super awesome. But what can I say? Uh, it's a good idea if you can make it work. <clears throat> Jonathan Campbell, what's up? You gotta boy, the time is flying. I'm gonna answer the next like ten questions, and then uh, I'm gonna get on with the tool du jour and the tour, and then I'll show you. Then we'll do some more more questions. Um, Ninety-eight Bluebird, forty-two foot rear engine, northeast. Uh, southeast, southwest. Any good community? Any good <laughs> schooly communities I know of in the Northeast? Man, I really don't. I'm sorry. Um, Stephen Cummings is asking me the pros and cons of where to raise the roof in the rear of a Bluebird All American rear engine above the emergency exit window or below. Good question, Steve. It depends on your floor plan and stuff. A lot of times. Above that rear engine platform is where a bed ends up going. And in that case, I would raise it um, below the emergency exit so that that window goes up higher and it stays off of your bed. Um, the other nice thing about doing that is the radius of the curve for the sheet that you have to hang, you know, around that window is a lot larger than the radius up high. The upper radius is like a very tight radius. Super tight. I mean, it's like a three inch radius or something. Whereas down at the bottom, I don't know, six or six, I don't know. It's more. And that's nice. That makes things a lot easier for you. Um, <clears throat> take a moment and grab something to drink. Doing it. Thank you. Mm -mm. All right. Oh, we got some good stuff. <clears throat> Uh, 
What's your method on deleting the rear windows, rivet, rivet or weld? I am currently welding them, but I might change my mind someday. I actually have a call scheduled with you Saturday. This is zero access. Sorry, I'm kind of stalking, I guess. <laughs> what are my thoughts on bus toy hauler conversions? Um, they're a great platform for it. They're, they're definitely built well enough to handle all of that, which I think is a good move. Uh, big rolling home. Someday soon I'll set up a solar console call with you. Oh yeah, I would love to help you. Um, and that's something anybody can do. There's a link in the description. You can go there and schedule a consult with me and I can do everything from help you wire up the system that you already bought to designing a fresh system from scratch and sell you the pieces you need to anything in between. Um, I'm available to help you and I love doing it. If I remove the bus heater, what can I use as a window defroster? Well, the best thing honestly is the bus heater up front. Like that's gonna be the easiest move. But if you insist on removing it, um, I don't have a lot of good options because I've never done that. I've pretty much always insisted that the clients I have keep that heater because it, that's what it's designed to do. And to me, the defrost on the front windshield, it's not, it's a safety thing. Yeah, but you can always pull over, but it's something that like, I don't want that stopping me from driving my bus, having a foggy windshield, you know? So I go pretty, pretty hard for keeping that. Uh, wolf dog buses, lead acid will always hold a special place in my heart. That's right. Lead and acid. That's a good time right there. Uh, different acid party. Yeah, exactly. What should I use to galvanize the places I have welded? Well, I don't think you can really galvanize it. I would just probably paint it with a nice primer. Um, do you know a good place to find schematics for a bus so I can rewire, I think was the question. Beth, I that's that's tough. Everyone's always looking for these freaking schematics, and I've gone my whole career without ever finding a full schematic for a build, except for the Wander Lodge, the two Wander Lodges that I've worked on, because they came with them in this lovely binder. But um, yeah, so I don't have a great great advice for you, other than if you want to, you can be meticulous and really kind of study the wiring and follow things and take it apart piece by piece. That's how I really learned my way around bus electro electronics, uh, gutting lots of buses, dealing with the problems, all that stuff. <laughs> uh, best way to remove rivets on a Bluebird. I saw your video and it said air chisel. That's right, an air chisel is the best way. Um, Hey Chuck, I've seen some of your videos and wanted to know my opinions on a TC2000 with a 5.924 valve and an AT545. Good question. So the TC2000 was made by Bluebird. It is the cheaper bus compared to the All-American. However, the All-American was not made in a lot of the really small sizes. So like if you're 30 foot or less, I don't think you're going to find an All-American in those links. They're probably all TC2000s and TC1000s. Um, they're awesome buses. Uh, back in my party bus days, my company owned a lot of those. I mean, probably, we probably owned more TC2000s than any bus um, because they're super common. The Cummins engine is a great engine. And if you are 30 feet or less, the AT545 is really, it's not an awful transmission. Um, it definitely gets a bad rap because people on the internet love to regurgitate things that they hear in other places, and I'm guilty of doing that too. But I can say from personal experience, living in Colorado, driving lots of AT545 equipped buses, including the one I own right now, um, over mountain passes, towing with them loads full of children and adults, I can say that if you keep that transmission with fresh synthetic fluid and keep it serviced and have a temperature gauge for the transmission fluid, it can last you a really long time. And the biggest drawback is just the fact that it's only got four speeds. So there's no overdrive on it. But you would have that drawback even if you had the upgraded version of the AT545, which is the MT643, that's like one notch up. That also didn't have an overdrive. Overdrive transmissions didn't come out until later on when they started having electronic transmissions. Your bus is interesting because it's new enough to have an electronic engine in the 24 valve Cummins, but it has an all mechanical transmission. Um, it's kind of cool. So if I were you, I would be pretty stoked on that bus, depending on how long it is. If it's 30 feet ish or less, I think you're sitting pretty. If it's a little longer than that, 
you know, what, do you, what else are you gonna do? Preemptively swap your transmission? Probably not. Just take good care of it and be ready to maybe upgrade if it ever decides to, um, you know, I can't think of anything other than shit the bed, so I'm just gonna say shit the bed. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Andy Williamson, hey Andy, how's your, we built a bus for Andy. Andy, how are you doing? He's an author and uh, lives full time in a freaking four window Chevy bus. That is really something special, a freaking amazing bus. Um, that is awesome. Oh, he's about to post his own, his first video, that's awesome. Andy, stoked for you, man. Uh, Co-pilot seat is usually full of snacks and charger cords. Well, yeah, that's what they're for. Um, snacks are my co-pilot. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Andy, yeah, I would love to shoot a tour of the bus we built for you. If you can make it to bus fare, man, I would definitely do it there for you. Uh, headset for driver isolation syndrome. Yeah, that's real. Or walkie-talkies. That's right. Um, all right, I'm going to do tool du jour, show you this bus. I'll come back and pick up these questions. Um, Beth Mickles, you gave me 10 bucks, and you didn't even ask me a question. Now, that is, that's generosity right there. <laughs> um, okay, Independence, Missouri, what a place. So, the tool du jour this week, and I do not think I've covered this one. It's one that I use a lot. And it's got lots of uses. And if you incorporate it into the woodworking portion of your build, it will give you, it's like a cheat code. It will give you the ability to make some really amazingly clean and tight cuts. And it will also give you the ability to put nice round over details on edges that just have a tendency to make your look, your build look like it was done by a professional, which is what I'm always trying to do is convince people that I'm a professional. And the tool du jour this week, ladies and gentlemen, is a cordless palm router. And um, the one that I have here, this is a Milwaukee. Um, I didn't buy this because Milwaukee's version is better. It's because I'm very well and thoroughly married into the Milwaukee battery family. And so this is the one that I bought. Um, I got this used on Facebook Marketplace and it was like still new, probably stolen for I think it was like 150 bucks. What is cool, if you don't know what a router is, I'll give you a brief <clears throat> explanation, but essentially it is a motor in here that spins very fast and at the end you have a cutter head and there are all kinds of different cutter heads available. This one, if you see that profile, it's a round over bit, so it's curved there and this is a ball bearing that rides on the edge of your wood and puts a perfect round over on it so that you, you bring this along your piece of wood and you get a round over. And I'm gonna show you, this is, this is an example, if you can see, you know, one side of this piece of wood. Will it focus? It'd be cool if it focused on it. Focus. One side, so these are square ends, right? And then over here, you can see after it's been rounded over, that is what you get, this nice round over. <clears throat> and that makes your finished products look really lovely. Another thing that it can do is it can be used to flush trim around window openings. And I will show you how that works or what it looks like on the inside there. But essentially what it is, is you have, again, on this cutter head, you've got a ball bearing and the ball bearing rides along a surface and the cutter head cuts anything that's proud of the surface that the ball bearing is riding on. So when I do my windows, I've got a window frame, I put the wall over that frame, and then I come with this, and I'm able to make a totally perfect cutout after the wall is already installed using a flush cutting router bit. This is a tool that will, if used properly, really elevate your finished carpentry game to a whole different level it's like a cheat code. It's super easy. It's not that expensive. Um, you don't have to have one, of course, but if you do, it'll make you look like a much better carpenter than you are. And I'm always trying to do that because I am really not a carpenter. That's just not my world. And I like these battery powered palm routers because routers themselves are dangerous tools. This cutter head spins very fast. It's very sharp. And a lot of the big routers, especially if you're a smaller person, 
can be unwieldy and intimidating when most of the time what you're doing is not trying to remove a ton of material. You're trying to do more of like a finish or detail piece of work. And so having a small battery powered palm router is a great way to go. And like when this thing's on, you know, it's pretty chill. It's nothing crazy and I love it. So check that out if you're interested in an easy way to really up your game. If you watch the video I made a while ago about the trim that I put up in my bus, you'll see me using that a lot. We also used it when we were hanging the walls to cut out our wall openings perfectly with a flush cutting router bit. So check that out. If you are getting ready to start on the woodworking portion and you've never messed with one, um, maybe you've got a friend who's got one you can try out. Um, and it's worth watching a video or two on how to use those safely um, and understanding what a climb cut is and how to avoid making those so that you can maintain control and avoid tear out when you're, you know, using your new favorite tool in your toolbox, the palm router. So hopefully that's interesting and useful for you. Now, if I can, um, I'm going to see if I can get my, yeah, it looks like we got the camera hooked up here. I'm going to go ahead and take you on a little tour of the bus that Brianna is working in. <clears throat> yeah, it looks like it's, oh, look at this, the infinity situation. So we're going to hop inside. And this is the bus that uh, Brianna and I have been working on this last week. Mm -mm. There's Brianna working diligently. Totally not watching your live. She's also watching the live. Um, you can see we've got all of our walls and ceiling in. Hey, look, it's Kiara coming in to inspect. And this is what that paneled ceiling looks like. So it's quarter inch birch plywood. Um, this is actually a hemlock batten strip that we used. I think they call it like lattice or something at the mill that we bought it at. And over here you can see where I used a flush cutting router bit to trim around the window openings really precisely. Like this is totally flush. And I'm pretty good at marking and cutting openings, but to get that level of precision, it's kind of insane. So. I really like doing that. Another place I can show you where we used, let's see, that round over bit here where I have wires coming out of the wall. This is a hole that I drilled with a hole saw and then I used a round over bit to round it over. And doesn't that just make it look a little more professional? That makes me so happy. <laughs> yeah, it makes Brianna very happy. And so it must be good. Um, Showing you what else we've got. We've got some Max Air vent fans. We put some new speakers in. This is gonna be her kitchen zone. Um, right here, we've got a under bench mounted AC unit. It's actually a heat pump. So it's an AC and a heat pump that you can use for heating made by Pioneer for RV use. So it's kind of like an all-in-one mini, mini split. Um, it vents through the floor, which is cool. So the installation is really simple. You just have one unit, it plugs into an outlet. It does need DC power, 12 volt, which is kind of annoying, but whatever. And then next to that, we have a Levaner diesel heater that we installed. And this is all gonna be under um, a bench that's going in this area. So that's pretty cool. This tiny little space is a very efficient heating and cooling setup. And honestly, it's a great, a great fit for just this five window short bus. Um, out here in the back, you can see we kind of finished it up. Oh, look, there's Brianna. Um, we've got a Suburban tankless water heater. Uh, I really like this model of Suburban tankless water heater. And let me see, I'll, I will show you why in a second once I hop out, but it has to do with how it's installed. And then we've got our three server rack batteries. We've got our um, AC and DC panel and then our DC to DC charger, and yeah, and our wirer, <laughs> wiring everything up. So this is that bus, we're pretty much done with it. I don't think we're gonna do anything else beyond that. We might um, do just a couple tiny things. Yeah, and that was a, the perfect time for my phone to disconnect, but I do wanna show you also why I love that Suburban water heater, and that's because on a typical RV water heater, you have to cut like a 15 by 15 square. And that's, 
Well, it's not ideal. And this, um, I think that's like a three and a half inch hole and that's it. And you put that grill on it and you're good to go. Here we've got our shore power connection and uh, you can see the RV windows, kind of trim that sealant up a bit. And some of the 360 bird's eye cameras, we got one there and one here. And uh, I would show you what that system looks like, but you're gonna have to watch the tour, I think, that we're gonna do. Hey, look, it's the shop. You're gonna have to watch the tour that we do um, and post, which will probably be in a couple weeks or something like that. So hopefully that was interesting for you. I'm gonna see what we have going on here in the old comments section. Um, and see what we've got here. Must be a small router. It is a small router. Um, doo -doo -doo. Uh, my rear handicap door is stuck shut. The handle does not turn. Wow. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I've never encountered that issue. Usually it's a pretty simple and pretty exposed mechanism. Um, so <laughs> I, would, I would hope and I would think that it would be easy to troubleshoot that, but maybe not. Um, <clears throat> Hey, Chuckster, that's a new one. One thing I find interesting, the amount of buses listed for sale with people talking about what a great interior, but they skip the mechanical side of it. Well, yeah, and that's, um, it's funny because like you would never buy a boat with leaks, right? <laughs> but a bus can have a bad engine and sit there and look great, but you won't find out how awfully it drives until you take it out on the road. And, I kind of feel like that happens all the time because it's really easy to overlook. A bus isn't gonna sink if it's got a bad engine. I was just talking to Brianna the other day about how I pretty much always have in my mind the next like two to three thousand dollars that I'm gonna spend on the bus mechanicals. There's just always seems to be something. It's tires, bearings, brakes, servicing the engine, servicing the transmission, servicing the coolant, um, Maybe a new turbo. I don't know. There's just always something to do. I want you to do the real tool du jour. Oh, <clears throat> Brianna also wants me to digress and talk about the real tool du jour that I actually got excited about. So anyway, I'll finish talking about the bus mechanical side of things. You really are so well off if you can take the time and educate yourself on your bus's engine, transmission, drivetrain, and understand how those work and how to even if you don't know how to do the work yourself, how to spot the signs and symptoms of trouble ahead of time so that you can get it addressed before you're out in the middle of nowhere. Because that is my ultimate biggest fear is having a big breakdown in the middle of nowhere. Because just where you have your breakdown might mean the difference between a $1,500 job if you do it preemptively at a shop and like a $5,000 job if you have to have a tow and then it's done at a shop where then you have to live in a hotel while they're working on it or even fly back to somewhere else while they do the work on it. So there's a lot of, well, there's a lot of motivation, I think, to be very preemptive in your bus maintenance. And I cannot stress the importance of that. And really, if you wanna be smart about it, I really would encourage anybody to plan on putting away like 25 cents a mile for maintenance and servicing until you have 10 grand saved up. Because if somehow you're able to save up 10 grand putting away 25 cents a mile, your bus is about due for a big breakdown. <laughs> um, because I mean, I've driven my bus since I bought it, I've driven it about 12,000 miles total. And I've put, I mean, if we're gonna count tires and everything, I'm probably into it for around three or four grand so far in both preventative maintenance and a little bit of upgrading to make it work better for my purposes. So here we go. So the real tool du jour that Brianna wanted me to do is this funny little doodad here, which is a plastic clip removal tool. It's got a little fork there for popping those little body panel clips off. And what I realized I love it for is in this wall, she's here because she wants to, she's satisfied. <laughs> The way that we did the walls on this bus are a little different than normal. Typically, I would mount my outlet and junction boxes to the framing and then cut my plywood around those boxes. That requires a lot of precision in measuring and cutting. And sometimes 
even if you're really good, you still mess it up and you have a cutout that's too big. So my, my method for this one was a little bit different and that was to put the wires in place, but then when it was time to install the walls, just have an opening already cut in the wall that is the size of the outlet box I'm using and use a remodel type outlet box. And that's an outlet or a junction box that connects to the wall instead of the studs. And what that allows me to do is cut my wall shape piece and then perfectly center and square and very precisely cut just the right size opening and then put that up, pull the wires through. And then I take this and I clean out all the spray foam in there because I have to make room for this junction box to fit in. And this tool is so perfect for scraping out that spray foam. I mean, let me show you. And everything else. And everything else. Clean it's, the wires with it. Yeah. You can, you can knock the holes out in the electrical box. It's nuts. Let me show you. Because I think, oh, those bo all the boxes are installed. I'm still going to try to show you briefly, if I can, um, what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yep. That's the one that we want. Whoop. There's Brianna. So if you see here. These are the remodel style outlet boxes. Oh, look, there's her notes. So you see how that box is screwed into the wall there? As opposed to be mounted on a stud, that's a lot easier to do. And like I've got another one here. And that tool in all of the boxes, if you look back there down the side, that tool is amazing for reaching into those spaces and scraping that out. And then you can use this little part, this U-shaped part, to scrape the foam off of the Romex or your Anchor cable that you're using. Um, and pop, yeah, pop the little knockouts on the back of the junction box. Well, here's why I'm so stoked about it, too, is these do pop out the plastic parts on vans. Mm -hmm. And I have needed one of these for, I don't know, 10 years now. But I've never wanted to buy one because you could just use a screwdriver and, like, you know, get them out. So and it break seemed them. like a waste. Of, yeah, I broke my fair share. <laughs> then you go buy the, the plastic clips. But I haven't bought one because it seems kind of gimmicky and like a waste. And then I finally got one a couple weeks ago, and I have used this thing for everything. Yeah, it's really handy. It's ridiculous. The little bend on it, too. It, like, helps you get in there. And then I had it sitting by the outlet boxes that I was carving out, and I hear Chuck getting – super stoked about it and realizing how useful it was. It yeah. Was so, good. <clears throat> so if you do your walls that way, this is a cool tool. I don't know really what it's called other than like a clip, clip remover. Cat's paw. But a cat's paw to me is a totally different tool um, that you would use like in carpentry for pulling out nails and trim pieces. Well, there's the crow's foot, which is bigger than the cat's paw. Cat's paw is crow's foot. Mm -hmm. Dog's paw is the biggest one. Um, do you have a video on wiring, on wiring delete? No, but everybody wants one and I, I would love to make one. The problem is every bus is different. So if I say this is what works and people do that without paying attention to the difference between the bus I'm showing it on and their bus, they could really put themselves in a bind. A world of hurt, but that is a very commonly requested video and Perhaps what I need to do is just bite the bullet and make one for a Bluebird, one for a Thomas. I mean, we've got Bluebirds and Thomas and Collins here. So I could do, that's three bus brands I could cover. But it's, it's a bit of a thing. And like, I don't really know how else to describe it other than I've done it a bunch. And I have an intuition on how buses are likely wired that helps guide me when I'm removing wires. I'm also familiar with like the colors of wires in different buses. So like purple is the interlock color in a Thomas bus. Green is the clearance light color in a Bluebird bus usually. I mean, things like that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we could do some bus trivia. That would be good. So much useless knowledge. Useless knowledge. Um, <laughs> have you ever worked with a bus that had a Mercedes diesel, the OM924? Um, not the 924, the, the only four cylinder Mercedes diesel that I've seen in a bus was an MBE 9, I think it was a 904, maybe it was a 924, but that's a recent bus. Um, the OM series of engines I always thought were associated with older um, buses or engines from Mercedes. 
So I guess to answer your question, no, not really. Uh, <laughs> on the interior, oh geez, where are we? Kelson J, hey, you're here. Oh man, I cannot wait to see both of you. Well, who is here? Is it Kels or is it Jay? Because I know you're not together right now. Uh, Zoe, you've got, you have this one too? Oh, the router, that's what you're talking about. Um, router, everybody loves the router. Yeah, we've got 148 watching and only six likes. What the heck? This is not cool. No, it's cool. I'm glad that you're all here. Um, you like the ceiling. Thank you. Um, you have a plug-in porter cable. Yeah, that's a great, that porter cable, uh, porter cable palm router is a great router. Um, is that a TC2000 next to the bus being worked on? Oh, well, it sure is, actually. Yeah, that, that's a 1992? 91. 91 TC2000. Good vibe bus. We really like that one. Um, it's got the Cummins 5.9, the Allison AT545. I mean, kind of in my mind, the quintessential TC2000. It's under 30 feet long. It's all mechanical. And uh, what's amazing is that that bus has like, it's a 92, right? And it 91. I keep on trying to make it a 92. It has literally zero rust on it. Like, it looks like it just rolled out. Oh, it's fun. Now that I can do this thing with my phone, I just want to show everyone everything all the time. So let me show you a little bit about that bus. What I really think is incredible about this bus is everything, but there it is. You know, we're going to be doing a roof raise on it. Maybe we'll document that. Let me see if I can show you. Brianna, let me know if the video cuts out. But underneath here, there is just like no rust at all. Not even the exhaust pipe. What the hell? And um, the more, the, even the most baffling part about this bus is the fact that it's been parked in this shop for like a month and it hasn't leaked a drop of oil. And that makes no sense to me because it it, it's out of oil. No. Um, yeah, and it fires right up. That's like a really sweet bus. Yeah, you can leave the battery connected. Some buses just want it, it you know. Good, but I've never had that good of a bus. Yeah, good bus. Classic TC2000. Um, <clears throat> love that router. Oh, yeah. I've seen the foam insulation board drainage channels. Yep, yep, yep. Um, tips for night lighting, interior and exterior, outdoor task lighting, red lighting, tiki lights. I mean, yeah, I like all types of lighting. I just like to put dimmers on everything that I can. Um, I even have dimmers on the exterior lights on my bus. Oh man, is that <laughs> lost trip? What is up? Uh, Chuck freaking Cassidy, man, that is another, well, another Charles. I do presume that is your real first name, but another excellent Charlie out there. Um, lost Renegades is the channel to check out to see what they're up to. Um, always say the best thing is to get used to how everything should look and sound when it's in good condition. You'll save yourself potential headaches that way if you do a quick pre-trip. Yeah, that's right. <clears throat> get used to how it should be. <laughs> um, and when things aren't, do something about it instead of just pretending like it doesn't happen. Because I know that temptation. I love pretending like everything's fine. Uh, that's how I get through most days of my life. But mechanically speaking, um, not the smartest coping strategy. Once we have our buses completed, there seems to be nowhere to live in them. Well, except Quartzsite, Arizona. Talk to us. Well, you can live on any Bureau of Land Management public land and remain in one spot for up to 14 days at a time. So that's millions of acres in the western half of the United States. So there is that. Um, outside of that, I mean, opening up uh, the search engine and checking out harvest hosts, um, some RV parks. I mean, it depends on the lifestyle that you're trying to have. But BLM land is probably the most popular choice for boondocking. The old, the old work boxes. That's right, Kelson J. Yeah, we, some people call them remodel. Um, some people call them old work, which means you're, which is kind of, kind of counterintuitive. It's where you're trying to put new work into old work, something that's already been built, you would use that style of box. So, um, but the irony is this is a new structure. But I guess if you think about it, the bus is old, so maybe it's all good. I don't know. 
Um, <clears throat> I was told RV Park wouldn't let custom build in because of higher insurance premiums. Is that true? Hard to say. You know, that's a legend and what a lot of places say. Um, I don't know if it's true or not, but I understand their concerns if they let you in in your school bus and it catches on fire because you didn't build it well and then it burns down like the rig next to you or something. That's a big problem. But also, a lot of times, you know, the old, my insurance won't let it happen is just a business owner's way of saying like, I don't want you in here. And yeah, and don't take it personally. Like, you know, they don't know what they're missing out on. We're cool people. At least most of the people I know are cool. <laughs> um, maybe a video about using relays when wiring. Well, yeah, relays, let me tell you, are a pretty handy toolkit to have in your wiring arsenal because not only do they give you the ability to control high current with low current, they also give you the ability to do really cool combinations of control circuits. Um, and I'm not going to talk too much about it because the subject of relays is one that I love. I, I don't shy away from using them when I need to, but a lot of people don't know how they work and they're very, very handy. Um, you can get a whole set of body panel snap pullers. You hear that, Brianna? Yeah. She's off to go buy a set right now, probably on Amazon. Oh, she's got it. <laughs> oh my God. And actually, I mean. Oh, it's got everything. I, I haven't been to the dentist in a while, but I actually think I could use these in the mirror tonight. I got a little bit of plaque buildup happening on my lower teeth. Do you even know what that magnet does yet? Yeah, the magnet's cool. It's on a telescoping handle and it's got a little collar that you pull off for removing things from it. And it's got a swivel head. It's also got a light on it. It's a little magnet tool. What is this? This is a kind of like get your ass out of jail free toolkit. It's the best thing I've watched. I honestly like this is a dental tool. Like, I could use this later. The O-rings out. Oh, it's for O-rings? <laughs> but, like, I have this build up here. I've been trying to get that, and, like, I don't have... This is the perfect tool for it. If it goes missing, I'm blaming you. Now, if it goes missing, it's still cheaper than going to the dentist. That's true. I'm just certain I don't have cavities. Just need a cleaning, you know? Oh, I love things that just, like, have good places for them to go away. Yeah, Brianna is queen of the grab bag concept. She likes things where she can just grab the bag and have all the stuff she needs. Lots of kits. Look at, Dude, look at this thing. the tiniest little kits. Maybe you can do the tool du jour. Well, not next week, but next time we're together. This has, oh my gosh, show this thing. This I is can't. my favorite. This is like 30 bucks. So, Brianna is less than half the size of me. And she's always buying these dinky little tool kits. And sometimes they're chintzy and I give her crap for it. But this one is from Weeha. Weeha makes really, honestly, really nice tools. Hopefully it focuses on there. Good handle. Oh God, it's, I can't even hold on to it with my big meat hooks. Um, it's got a nice ergonomic handle, but what's cool is that it's got a magnetic uh, hex drive on it that fits bits. And so there's a whole assortment of bits here. And one of them includes this guy. <laughs> which, you know, is just a standard bit holder that you would put on an impact driver. But when you're working in tight spaces like electrical boxes uh, with, you know, small terminals that you have to ratchet up and stuff, these are really handy. This has an extender and it's got the whole pocket portfolio of bits. Brianna, we're wasting all your tool du jours though because I do want her to do it. I think you should do a tool du jour. We'll have her do a tool du jour next time. We're about to not be together though for a few weeks, so you're gonna have to be patient while we go live our separate lives. I don't even know how to put this back in the book. There we go. And it's like, when she got this out, I was like, oh, is that a harmonica? Nope, but it does make that sweet, sweet sound of a ratchet going The sound of nuts getting tight. <laughs> I'm laughing. Um, all right, I'm going to be signing off here in just a couple of minutes because uh, it's time and it's time. But what else do we got? Oh, we see 109 likes over there. Okay, maybe my video just needs to update because I was like, man, why do only 11 people like my video? 
Um, oh, geez, are they? Okay, here we go. Um, Mustache Mike says, nice kit, nice kit, Brie. I have to say, because I am her friend, that she doesn't like being called Brie. If you call her Brie, she'll say Brie is a cheese, and she is not a cheese. So, Mike, your comment was good spirited, and I know she appreciates it. But anyone watching, don't call her Brie. She is, or call her Brie Moria. She is Brianna. She appreciates that. Um, Chuck's was a dental hygienist in his past life. <laughs> All right, Derek, uh, snow chains, winter gear, any recommendations for going into the mountains? Yeah, well, definitely snow chains. And you'll want to get snow chains that fit your specific size tires. They are expensive and heavy, and I would practice putting them on once at least before the time comes when you need them. Because if you've never done it before, it's not the most intuitive thing, perhaps. And it's definitely not going to be, it's already not going to be enjoyable when you have to bust out the chains because it's going to be cold, snowing, and you're going to be wet. And you're going to want that job over with as fast as possible. And if you're trying to figure it out on the fly, it's definitely not going to be the fastest you could do it. So chains are a big one. I would also make sure if you're going into cold weather, how does your bus do starting in the cold weather? Um, do you need to have a way to plug it in to a block heater or something to preheat the engine? Because you might. That would be stuff that I would investigate. Make sure that the antifreeze mixture you have in your engine gives you sufficient freeze protection down to the temperature you're going. That's reflected by the ratio of antifreeze to water. If you have too much water, the freeze point will be high. And if you have enough antifreeze, the freeze point should be low enough. You wanna be 50-50 is a good rule of thumb. 50% water, 50% antifreeze. Um, outside of that, make sure your defrost works. Put some new wipers on there. Make sure your washer fluid is full and working because the, you know, the stuff they put on the roads, you're going to want to have a clean windshield, and that stuff makes your windshield trashy. Um, good tires. There are mud and snow tires that you can get for buses. That's what I'm going to be putting on the rears of my bus. I'll do a video about that, but I haven't done it yet. Um, and, yeah, if your bus has air brakes, two things. First, you should always get in the habit of draining the water out of your tanks um, at the end of every day of driving because if you have water in your lines and it's freezing, that water will freeze and that can cause problems. They do make an antifreeze you can put into your air brake system, which I've actually never used, but um, I, that isn't to say that I haven't had a time when uh, my rear parking brakes would not release uh, in sub-zero, well not sub-zero, but quite cold temperatures. And uh, the, only, the only workaround I had for that was uh, shooting a map gas torch near the valve until it finally released. And that wasn't that cool because I was rolling around on the ground in the snow, and that's not a lot of fun. Um, yeah, yeah, she's saying if you can't hear, if you have air in the lines, it could prevent the air that is applied when you push the pedal from reaching the brakes and actually applying your brakes. And that's dangerous for really obvious reasons. Um, oh, zero access. I didn't know you were a diesel mechanic. That's cool. Uh, Jordan Motorsports hit me with three bucks. Thank you very much. Uh, honestly, any, any, you don't have to give me anything, but anything you do give me is very appreciated. Oh, Brianna just can't let it go. What is that? I didn't even know this. Can you tell what just happened? What just happened? This little thing, you pull it down, and it pushes the bit up. So you can so, grab the bit so you easier? you can grab it out because it's so magnetic and you can't pull it out normally. And then this. Very thing. cool. Oh, my God. It's amazing. Weha makes really good stuff. It's, it's really expensive, but it is really good. Uh, great to you guys, see you guys. I appreciate your insights. Thank you. Build that bus now. Um, I bought some of the car saver you recommended for, oh, chassis saver. Yeah, that stuff is serious. Um, super serious. Oh, I think I've answered everyone's questions about everything. I'm going to hit these last few and then I'm going to sign off because here I am 20 minutes over. Um, keep you updated on the under the bench mini split unit. Well, I can tell you right now, like it's, not going to be as efficient or as effective as a typical mini split 
it's only 9,000 BTUs of output. Whereas um, the largest 120 volt mini split you can get is 12,000 BTUs of output. That's like 33% more. Um, okay, so Brianna says we're gonna do tests on it. So we will do tests on it apparently. It also, because, here's a good rule of thumb. The, the biggest, best ways to make an air conditioner or a mini split or any type of system that involves heat pumping more efficient is to increase the size of the evaporator core and the condenser cores. These are essentially radiators that allow the heat that the system is pumping to be either absorbed from the environment or dispersed into the living space. And the bigger they are, the more efficient they are because the more surface area they have. This unit is really small for what it is. And that means that it's not going to be as efficient as a conventional two-part mini split. Now, it's like way easier to install. It takes up way less space. And on a bus this size, we feel really good that it's, because this bus is only 14 feet long from behind the driver's seat, and it's insulated with almost, you know, between two and a half and three inches of spray foam everywhere, which is really not overkill, but it's a lot of insulation. I think it's gonna have no problem keeping up with that. And hopefully, the solar panels on the roof will be enough to, you know, keep it balanced out. That's what we're hoping for. Every bus is new, you know, there's a lot of variables there, but that's the goal. And frankly, it's a much better option for a small space in terms of the install and the space it takes up on the inside and outside than a conventional mini split, at least in my opinion. Now, if this bus was bigger, I would maybe consider a different option, but there, they're pretty cool and the install is easy. You just, you have to cut a couple of squares in the floor for the venting because it vents out through the floor and then a hole for the condensate drain for the condensation. Get it some AC power, get it some DC power. And if we were doing a full build here, we would install the remote on a wall somewhere. But since, you know, there's more building to be done that hasn't happened yet, but they're cool. So just something to keep in mind, you know, there's a lot of options out there and I'm really, I'm stoked that Pioneer makes this. It's a, it's a really handy, handy thing. Um, yeah, so big rolling home. You've got 9,000 BTUs of output, but 38 SEER. SEER is the efficiency rating. I think the SEER rating on this is somewhere in the low teens. So it's a linear relationship. So big rolling home, he might be three times the efficiency of this one, which means for every watt you put into this, the system for heating and cooling, he's getting three times as many BTUs of heating and cooling out of it. And that is obviously a big deal. Now, I bet that that unit is way bigger than this one and it's a two piece unit and the installation is significantly more complicated, but those are the advantages of going that direction. Um, so is, uh, is Brianna taking over building buses? Yeah, Chris, I think so. I think I'm retiring. Brianna's going to be taking my place doing the work. She, she's, kind of, she's kind of my apprentice now. And then maybe one day when I get tired of teaching people, she can take over. And she claims to be retiring now too, but like I'm way older than her. So like you're not, you, she needs to pay her dues if you ask me. She, yeah, she, psh, lots of psh going on around here. Uh, <clears throat> Don't tell Chuck, he likes to think he's in charge. <laughs> yeah. uh, hey, Jordan Motorsports, thanks for the 10 bucks. That's, um, yeah, I just appreciate it all. All right, I think I'm about to get out of here. Uh, Returning to Earth, hey Chuck, you're a gem. Fantastic teacher, large brain, voice for radio. Some would say a face for radio too. <laughs> We're all lucky to have you doing your work on the planet. Well, that makes me feel very happy and on such a good note i feel like i should probably end it here um are we going to get to see the short bus full build out no because we're not doing the full build out we are pretty much stopping here once we get the systems installed but i will do a tour video of this bus before it leaves so that you can compare and contrast that with the video that we made when we listed it for sale when it was gutted and just an empty shell um, there's also a video out there of how we installed the subfloor so it's a pretty well documented bus Kind of inadvertently hopefully it's helpful to you it's going to be really cool though we're brian and i are very happy about the way it's turned out and 
our working relationship is relatively new and um, we're pretty stoked to collaborate on this and see how nice it turns out. Wouldn't you say, Brianna? Yeah, your producer was right. <laughs> <laughs> and you got to see how bright they are now. Yeah, I did. I did. So anyway, I think I'm going to be signing off here. What's up, bus? What's up, Brian? Oh, man. Everybody's friggin' pop. You can't show up this late in the live chat because I'm going to want to keep chatting with you. Um, yeah, okay. I'm going to get out of here. Thank you all for tuning in. It means a lot to me. My name's Chuck Cassidy, obviously. There's... Um, a lot of great things happening out here in the world. And thanks for letting me be one of them in your life. I will check you again here next Thursday. I'll be doing a live. Brianna won't be here, so it'll be a little bit lonely. And uh, I've got a great video coming out on Sunday about uh, picking up the last of the three auction buses that me and Brianna bought. And, uh, you know, some things that happened along the way. And you might want to check that out before I get back into the swing of some proper how to building videos yeah back to my roots i gotta finish the bus i'm living in you know anyway we will see you next time and thanks for letting me be a part of your night